Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambutasa Utang Tamang Sankang Namasami Well, it's uh, very wonderful and inspiring to be here today with everyone and uh, just to feel the good energy. And it always, uh, I did come once to an event of Cloud Mountain last year and I always remember the, the sense of the vibrancy of the community. This is a very alive and vibrant community <coughs> and diverse also. It's beautiful. So it's, uh, it makes me very happy even just to think of you all. It makes me very happy. Um, and this is a day of, of giving, a day of generosity, and you know, with a with a vision, the vision to support the, an establishment of a monastery in the Seattle area. <coughs> um, and it is very inspiring to see so many people come together for this here and further afield, and and how incredibly generous the support has been so far. May that continue so that the vision is fully realized. Um, and I was reflecting on, <coughs> excuse me, on the, uh, the um, uh, this morning, Ajahn Nisipo wrote a little message saying, um, you know, what is the, what is the, Dhamma qu the Dhamma quote or Dhamma teaching that's been most important through your practice? And for me it was, uh, all conditions are transient. There is no self in the created or the uncreated. I remember when I first heard that, it, uh, when I was about 21 or 22, I think I was, it gave me so much joy to hear that, that teaching. All conditions are transient. Everything's changing, and there is no self in any of it. Wow, that is so liberating. That is so freeing. And then, of course, there's the long journey to, to uh, really deeply understand what that means. And uh, I think when I first heard it, there was a th here, for this one, a very strong sense of separate self. And I think for certainly in America, the conditioning is very strongly that way. You're a separate individual personality, you know, and you make your way in the world. And, and uh, you know, there are strengths to that, but there's also this great weakness in that, that it's not really true. We're not really, I mean, we are all absolutely unique individuals. Just look around the room here. No two people alike. We're all very unique. And I love that about human beings. We all ar arise in our unique ways. And yet, we are absolutely part of each other. We're all interconnected. We're all, right now, in this room together, we're all breathing together. We've all shared meal together. Um, you know, we are, in a way, and we've, and we've um, chanted together and shared together in the, a sense of generosity and giving. And this, you might notice, breaks down that sense of separation of, of me. You know, what it's not about, you know, it's, it's about the community. It's not about one person who's done something extraordinary. It's about the coming together of everyone and everyone being part of the, the generosity and the maybe um, gradual or sometimes rapid transformation of the heart in a sangha, in a community like this. So these practices, so we have these forms, very beautiful forms of the precepts. So there's the, the formal requesting of the precepts, which is an ancient tradition that's been going on since the Buddha's time. Those five precepts have been chanted, they've been taken by people ordinary people since the time of the Buddha, all these 2,600 years, this is this practice.
practice has been going on, and there's and there's these beautiful forms for that that we can do together, and then there's what we bring to that, what we bring to those forms. So, obviously, if we just come and we chant, and we learn the chant, and we and we chant the precepts, and then forget about them, you know, it's, a, it's we get a few moments perhaps where it feels nice, and then we're back in our old muddle of uh, struggling through our life. So the, these forms are intended to be, to ha that we, we breathe life into them, they're to be lived. So with the, these five precepts, they're a, a support and a blessing for our lives and also a, a source of fearlessness for, the, for others. So we become somebody who is safe in this world where there is so much distrust and um, you know manipulation and uh, confusion really there's a there's a lot of confusion in the world there probably always has been so as one who keeps the lives by those five precepts you're, you're helping to align with really deep true values of ethic ethical values and uh, and becoming a source of safety in the world and uh, also requesting the Dhamma talk. There's this beautiful chant that Kate has been doing to request the formal offering of Dhamma. It's, it's very a uh, very beautiful tradition to formally request the teaching. And then there's, there's the listening to the talk. And then, you know, so I've, I've met um, people in America who, you know, they, they love to listen to the Dhamma and study the Dhamma and maybe go on courses. They want to go on a course that where you study the Noble Eightfold Path, and then when you've done that, you go on another course where you can study maybe, you know, ethics, and you know, go on all these courses, and then at one point they say, okay, I've done all these courses, now what? It's like, no, no, you do a course and then you practice. You make it yours, you live it, you know. You don't even have to do a course, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so you learn a little bit of Dhamma, and then you apply it to your life, to your, to your actual life, so, so that your life transforms. And uh, it is a, a wonderful path. So it, you know, and no matter where we start from, it doesn't matter where we start from, what, how confused we are, how much harm we might have done in the past, how lost we may have been, it doesn't matter. As soon as we hear the Dhamma, really hear it, and we start to align our life with the Dhamma, everything changes. And I'm not going to. I'm not saying it's easy. So we have to sometimes work very hard, and sometimes we have to sit through, um, you know, remorse of things we've done in the past that we wish we hadn't done, or, or, um, you know, we get to know ourselves better. And sometimes it's a little bit disappointing, you know. I speak personally, you know, like, oh, okay, there's that. Okay, can't really get away from that one. And you know, one has to sort of accept oneself as one is. And like I said, we are all very unique. We all have something to give. We all have, we all have something um, beautiful and precious to bring into the world in our own particular way. And we all have flaws. We're all, you know, a little bit imperfect as a separate individual. And that's why community is so essential. That we come together, and we oh, listen to that for a moment. We come together and uh, we become whole together. And we're not meant to be complete, you know, like good at everything and perfectly, you know, rounded individuals. You know, we often we have this, this idea that's been given to us of how we're supposed to be, and then we never live up to that. And so then there can always be this sense of lack and sense of not good enough or sense of, you know, I have to keep trying there's something wrong with me you know that this happens a lot or worrying <gasps> gosh how am I going to manage I'm just not as perfect as I'm supposed to be and and uh, so the Dhamma is very forgiving it's very uh, it has it, it's the arms are wide and friendly in the Dhamma it's uh, it's not asking us it is it is inviting us to realize our own perfection but it's not asking us to be perfect personalities or perfect human beings and this is uh, one of the things I love about the the practice is that you know when you practice the say the precepts you're practicing 
because you realize it's painful to not do that. You recognize the, what you have to live with, what you have to sit with when you're not living in an ethical way. The, the ways one has to sort of duck and dive or deceive oneself if one's not living in a, or and others, if one's not living in an ethical way. And that it's actually kind of nicer to live ethically. Not always easiest thing to do, but it's, a, it's, it's beautiful. So we align ourselves to that truth, and then there's, a, there's an ease and a peacefulness that comes from that. And, uh, you know, with the, with the practice, when we're practicing meditation, so just, just to get stuff on that, actually, that, you know, here today, with there's been the taking of the precepts, we've had a little, little meditation together, and then acts of generosity. So these three qualities, dana, sila, and bhavana, these are, these are the, the kind of, um, like the, the embracing of the path. All that when, we do those, when we practice those three qualities, then our life is transforming. And we're not doing it in order to be a, a good person or a perfect person, but we're doing it because it is good, because it is beautiful. And then as we do that, cause it is it, 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 because it does bring peace. And as we live in this way, our life just starts to transform. And so it's like almost like a side effect that we become good people. But it's not that the path is about trying to become the perfect person. It's about understanding the truth of the way things are. So with, uh, with dana, with giving, we start to experience the breakdown of separate individual self, me and mine and what I need and how, I, how I've got to take care of myself. We, we break out of that separation into we, into a flow actually of, of giving, of generosity. It releases us from that uh, small separate experience of me and mine. And also with the sealer, you know, at first it can be um, hard work if we're trying to change uh, the course of a river in our life. It can be hard work for a while, and then after a while it's just beautiful. It's just a natural way to, to be. Why would anyone not want to live in a way that's harmless and truthful and generous and respectful? And, you know, why would one not want to? So at a certain point it just becomes natural. And then with bhavana, with uh, practice, cultivation. So that's cultivation on the cushion in, uh, in medita form meditation, but it's also cultivation throughout our life in everything we do, potentially. That's the invitation that the Buddha gives us to bring uh, mindfulness and kindness and awareness to everything that we do. To everything that we do and also to our intention as to why we are doing what we're doing. And as we s take that on, little by little, it becomes more natural. So the Dhamma, one of the translations of the word Dhamma is nature. So the Dhamma is aligning us to become more attuned to the natural way of things. And that's inherently peaceful. And the more we're operating from a sense of a separate individual personality, you know, the, the story that the, that the world tells us we're supposed to be, the more alienating it gets and the more difficult it gets, the more of a struggle it is. And we wonder why we're suffering so much. And it's we're suffering so much because we're not aligned with reality. So the Dhamma is the truth of the way things are. So this, this uh, reflection, all conditions are transient. And I love that word, transient. Here in America, transient, it also means that like these people in the tent city that are moving in here, that also means people who don't have a place to live, who move from place to place. And uh, transient, before I knew that, um, so that that's I just learned that over here in America. And when I first heard the translation, all conditions are transient, it, that word just gives the, it kind of, um, conveys the quality of, of ever change. So it's not just that things change, like we all know that things change. It's not that just like there are things and then they change, but, but it's all changing all the time. 
And so how, and, and the more we understand that, the more we really understand the changing nature of things. And it's, you know, it's a, an invitation to let go because we recognize it's painful to hold on, to try and f hold on to that which is changing. It's going to change anyway if we hold on or not. So it's an invitation as we reflect on, in our practice, as we reflect on everything's transient, everything's changing. Okay, everything's changing. So there's letting go is part of it, but also if everything is changing, how can we influence that? So if everything is changing, you know, can we bring a little bit of love into that which is changing? A little bit of patience or generosity. So we're bringing in the, the beautiful qualities, spiritual qualities into this ever-changing world. So if we're living in a way that I is um, perceiving ourselves and the world as fixed, then uh, it can feel very stuck. And uh, you know, if we have a fixed perception of the future, we can feel um, very anxious or or hopeless sometimes in a sense of oh gosh, you know, it's just going to end up like this. But uh, the reality is how we meet the moment, how we arise how we respond to any given moment in our life is is it's changing us it's changing us and it's changing our environment who we're with what we what we're around so we have as we grow in greater clarity that greater awareness greater mindfulness we have more and more choice around that we're not so driven by our old habits so until we bring awareness to our body, speech, and mind, we tend to be reactive, and we, we've, we're conditioned. You know, we've got certain conditioning from our families, our, our culture, uh, maybe just personal things that have happened, and then we'll we'll react out of that. We'll we'll uh, rather less consciously react to the world from those old conditions, and with mindfulness and awareness we have a choice. So it gives us, it shows us there's a little space between the, you know, the, the, the situation that happens, how we're touched by something, and our response. There's a little gap there where we can not just react with the same old pattern, where we can maybe just feel it for a moment, and maybe step out of our fixed view about a person or a situation and see whether we can see it in a different way or just even just taking it and taking a challenging situation as an opportunity to respond in a wholesome way like what would it be like to really listen to someone who's quite hard to listen to what would it be like just to really listen to them just to do a listening practice Very beautiful. And uh, what would it be like to to be generous when we feel afraid to be generous? It doesn't mean we have to give everything away. You know, we don't have to leave ourselves destitute. But what if we just respond in a different way to how we how we immediately feel we we are conditioned to feel? So in in those little steps, we start to transform the way we are and in that we're transforming the way we experience the world and we are also transforming the world so here this gathering here today this is this is some one of the things that's happening in the world today and it probably won't get onto the news the good news rarely gets on to the news but it is happening it is happening good people are gathering sharing being generous, supporting a beautiful potential of a monastery. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of goodness here. The choirs of angels singing upstairs. <laughs> it's it's pretty awesome. <laughs> so, you know, we 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 can in how we meet our experience inside and outside, we uh, have an opportunity to transform transform our heart to be a source of 
of safety, a source of, of kindness, a source of generosity, a source of wisdom. You know, the Buddha says the Dhamma is to be experienced individually by the wise. And when I first read that, I thought, oh, that's like those wise people out there somewhere, you know. They're the ones who experience it, okay. And it's like, no, no, it's, it's to be experienced by the wisdom within each of us. We all have wisdom, it's part of what we are. So the Dhamma is to be experienced by our own, through our own wisdom, through the wisdom that is in each of our hearts. And I say our own wisdom, it's not really ours actually, it's, it goes beyond who and what we are, but it's known here in our heart. So we have this beautiful opportunity of a, in this life. You know, we've been very fortunate to come across the Dhamma. Some people here have been have the good karma to be born in Buddhist countries and to be, you know, raised with Buddhism. This is very you could very good karma. And some of us have found it in various ways along the way, you know, later. Young or middle aged or old, it doesn't matter actually. I know people who say, oh, I just wish I'd come across the Dhamma when I was younger. You know, maybe they're 50, 60, 70. Oh, if only I'd come across the Dhamma when I was younger. No, you came across the Dhamma in this lifetime. This is awesome. Now is the time. This is the time for practice. It's now. It's with this. It's with this aging body. It's with this life situation. It's now, always now. So we have this uh, beautiful opportunity, and as a community, you know, as, as was mentioned, you know, it's not, not all easy. There's going to be um, differences and disagreements and uh, different culture clashes, and all of those things can happen. And we can take that as uh, part of what of how to learn to be together and to be generous. And you know, my, my deep wish is that uh, this monastery, Cloud Mountain, Cloud Mountain, Clear Mountain Monastery, excuse me, Clear Mountain Monastery, um, will be a place really for, for you all to deepen your practice, to gain insight, to lighten your load, to free yourself of the burdens of uh, a separate individual self. And to enjoy the the uh, lightness and the beauty and the freedom that the Dhamma points us to. So I offer that to you.